a shot. Um, this is Too Many Words. I'm Jamie Benningfield, the host. This is my show. I appreciate you tuning in. Good stuff. I, uh, I have Hugo Award winning editor uh, Neil Clark. He is the editor of Clark Wor- World's Magazine, Forever Magazine, and uh, quite a few anthologies. Cool dude. And it was a fun talk. I'm, look for- I'm looking forward to sharing it with you uh, here in a bit. Real quick, I wanted to talk about my other show, Elliot Granger and the Clues Brigade. Um, about to uh, about to publish uh, chapter nine this Friday, and uh, the you know recording of that on uh, iTunes on Saturday. And I've been receiving uh, a, a lot of uh, messages from listeners reaching out to me, letting me know that they really like Elliot and um, listening to um, or reading Elliot experiencing grief as she continues to you know mutter around in life um you know has been uh, comforting some people so um you know if you're one of those people and you let me know thanks for uh, reaching out uh elliot is a <clears throat> has is a bit of a passion project for me um you know uh part and because of you know the uh, Elliot Granger character herself um, is uh, she means a lot to me. She represents uh, <clears throat> a hard time, and uh, also because I'm I'm learning a new way of storytelling, and you know she Elliot's helping me do that. I uh, I like challenging myself, and I uh, also am enjoying uh, you know not working by outline. I've been so religiously. Um, following an outline with all my projects and setting it up that uh, I'm uh, enhancing it, if you will. Uh, well, I have I have each character's goal in mind. I'm judging, you know, what to do next by. But uh, thank you for your kind words and your support. Um, and uh, thank you, of course, for tuning in. How is everybody? What's up? What are you doing? How's your week been? Short week for some because of Memorial Day weekend. I, uh, it's, uh, it's been a weird week for me because of that. And it's not because it was a short week. I actually worked on Memorial Day and, uh, I had, uh, I'm working towards this deadline, uh, for Friday and I'm, uh, I'd like to hit it. I, uh, I'm able to hit it. I just, you know, focusing is a thing, but anyway, so I killed it, um, with my goals on Monday, but after that, you know, it's like, you know, I, you know, I ate the tainted apple. Uh, I worked on Memorial Day and my focus for the rest of the week has just been all over the place. It's been, uh, you know, pay me now or pay me later. I don't know. Uh, between being a mother of two, a wife, a full-time writer, the feeling of inadequacy isn't one I'm a stranger to. Uh, you know, this week it's just particularly loud. You know, I, I hit a, stri- a stretch there for a couple of weeks where I was uh, handling the balance. But uh, as I cruise toward deadlines and growing the show, and I find myself yet again off balance with, you know, my juggling stance. And perhaps I can do a better job listening to my lack of focus and go take care of some real life things. But I usually don't. I'm obsessive and stubborn. And when it comes to my goals, those qualities both assist me and fight to destroy me. Um, this is the first year that I'm, you know, juggling with the size of workload and the family life and f- for the first time. And I, I've, I've mentioned my te- tendency to work too much. And sometimes it is instead of coping with something in reality, I'd rather not. And other times I'm just grinding away at this thing, you know, um, Two things dawned on me over lunch um, the other day as my husband and I talked about, you know, how he's handled work-life balance over the years. And for one, he's a nicer human being than me. And second, I haven't been asking myself the right questions. Uh, You know, I realize things aren't black and white and some days are going to be balanced better than others. And my feeling of accomplishments and jerky regrets, you know, often move as a wave does. And, you know, it's... uh, it's working from home is just weird. Oh, you know, and my, my office is located, you know, in my, in my basement. I mean, I don't think it's like, I don't think a realtor would call it a basement, but you know, my downstairs area and it's, you know, by the back door where I let my dogs out and it's by my laundry room. So, 
you know, come evening time or weekend, you know, I, I have plenty of reasons to like walk by my desk and I walk by my desk and like, you know, my computer whispers at me. It's like, hey, Jamie. But see, I actually, yeah, see you back again. I can't whisper. <laughs> um, I'm, I really can't. But anyway, imagine whispering um, because my computer's, um, my computer's really good at whispering. And it's weird because like, uh, you know, during the day, I won't want to leave my house at all. Like, not to go grocery shopping. I don't want to interrupt myself. Like, I already don't like, you know, doing some of these more mundane, like, chores, whatever. Like, you know, adult, boring adult stuff. I can't stand that. And, you know, but, I'll, but you know, so it messes with my, you know, my, my creative state. I realize how this sounds but anyway so and it's weird because I don't want to like especially grocery shopping like getting myself out of my comfort zone you know making myself put on jeans because like that's it like sometimes you know I'll do video call or whatever and um people can see my top half so like, like my top half is always like dressed you know I've got like my button down shirt combo and my necklace of the day um you know I usually forget to brush my hair but it's just, I call it part of my look. But then, like, my bottom half will be, you know, pajama pants or holdy leggings. And I'll forget that I never actually finished getting dressed. So that always adds to, like, the strangeness of leaving the house. Is because I won't realize that I'm I'm wearing pajama pants until I'm, you know, in Trader Joe's, you know, picking out bananas or whatever it is that I'm getting at Trader Joe's, you know. And it's, like, and I'll find these, I'll try to find these little pockets of times to do errands and, you know, it'll be between, you know, wrapping up this one scene and I'll be thinking about it. But it's time to, you know, it's, uh, I just got a chunk of time in, a lot of words logged, good time to step back and refresh my mind. So I'll be like, okay, you know, I'll go to a grocery store <clears throat> on my way to Trader Joe's uh, the other day, you know, I'm driving down this, you know, more secluded street. I tend to avoid the crazier roads. I, I have all these, um, you know, like way longer roundabout back ways of getting everywhere. So I was on one of those ways and I'm chugging along, you know, blasting whatever. I think uh, it was uh, Kingdom by Evangeline. I'm thinking about like this kind of dark stuff and alleyways and whatever. And up, of, up from the road from me, there's a black pickup truck um, pulls, you know, starts pulling an illegal U-turn in the middle of the road. <laughs> My first thought is Raiders. Like, it's not even like, well, I wonder what this guy's doing or this jackass. I'm like, Raiders! You know, and I actually, like, picture, like, a whole bunch of people, like, you know, in, like, dirty clothes coming out with, like, baseball bats with spikes on it. Just probably proof that I consume and contribute way too much to post-apocalyptic fiction it's it's in my head all the time I mean uh and I feel like that's a step above like you know getting the bag of dog food out of the car at night and I think zombie it, it's different like this is broad daylight you know it's a Wednesday um and here I am like you know it's happening the end is near I don't know ah <sighs> See, I should have taken the three day weekend. Uh, yeah, I'll be I'll I'll be bugging myself about that one for a while. I don't know. I try, and I think for the most part, as far as balance, I do okay. I mean, I mean, it's extra loud at the moment because there's something about the you know school is wrapping up for my kids, and that just turns like all this stuff up like full blast. There's field trips and there's this event and there's this extra project and like all these inputs and you know various like teacher appreciation things and it's just uh, my daughter um, was in the talent show her school talent show last week and uh, my son was putting on his big you know finishing kindergarten performance and so like there was that going on you know during the week as well and we told them like we can't fit in celebrating this during the week but during the, when the weekend comes we'll go for dinner you get to pick the place <clears throat> well my kids uh, picked Olive Garden and they love Italian food um, but they're used to my Italian food, um, which I learned from my grandmother. And uh, she came over from Sicily when she was in her 20s and a whole bunch of their family came over too. So um, even though I'm only, you know, that's only one side of my family was Italian, you know, they were, it was a very, 
very rich um, culture at my fingertips. And I've tried on my own to facilitate that for my kids. And, uh, you know, I, it's definitely not like the um, seven course spectacles um, that I'm used to. Uh, but I, I infuse things in any way. Um, they were excited to, you know, go to Olive Garden and being as much as I love the Seattle area, um, you know, there isn't uh, an abundance of Italian restaurant choices. Um, but anyway, so we were um, in Olive Garden and my son, I went, he ordered uh, pasta and meatballs and they brought the dishes out and he poked at the meatball and he had this big bottom lip out. and He's like, oh, mom, I, mommy, I don't think I can eat this this is a soft meatball. I only like your meatballs. And like, there was this little Italian woman standing inside of my head that was like, yes, like she was celebrating. Like, your son only wants your meatballs. Like, that's a win. You just won. You won at life. So that was my, that was my parenting win. And then they proceed the next day. They're like, are you, both of my kids are like, make spaghetti and meatballs, make spaghetti and meatballs. And I did, and they were excited. It was good. My, uh, my maternal win for the week, you know, that was, of course, before I worked Memorial Day. Yeah, parenting, it's, it's a wacky thing. A lot of, pretty much everything I do, I can say that about. Yeah, well, that pretty much seals that. Um, my official, my new official title, title is uh, Doer of Wacky Things. Well, before I continue to go on about whatever it is I am going on about, let's get to uh, my chat with Neil Clark after this note. Hey, Neil. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for having me. Oh, no. Thank you for coming on. I've been, uh, I've actually been really looking forward to our chat. Uh, Clark's World Magazine is just an awesome spot to find um, just really quality stories. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so, and you have, um, the timing worked out pretty good because you have the, um, best science fiction of the year anthology, um, coming up, set to release June 7th, right? Yes. Uh, it's already available though at a couple of the online booksellers. Uh, they don't always stick to the on sale dates, so <laughs> not going to complain. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and this is the first volume of that particular anthology, correct? Yes. Uh, um, I'm working on next year's volume now, um, and uh, we're going to see how, many, how, how much further it goes, uh, uh, with, I guess, based on the sales of the first volume. That's fair. Yeah. No, well, um, you, you have so, you have so, you have your hands in so much. Like, how, so how did you get to the, how did it all come to be basically how how did you um you know you started with clark's world magazine correct before well uh yes and no i mean i I took a really circuitous route to to get to to publishing um my background is in computer science uh and and my day job which i hope to be ending shortly um has been in that for the last 25 plus years um it wasn't a career I thought I'd end up in, uh, but I've always been a science fiction fan. So at some point along the way, um, I became a collector. And if you know anything about collectors, you end up with lots of copies <laughs> of of the same book because you find a better copy. Uh, um, so I ended up drifting into um, book selling. So I had an online bookstore and the magazine was launched as a companion to that bookstore and the bookstore collapsed a year later uh, and the magazine I loved so much I kept it going. So when the bookstore closed, um, I launched Worm Publishing as the the new parent for Clark's World and some other side projects. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, collecting. So you collected um, books then? Is that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny uh, that that uh, uh, a book collector ended up doing so much <laughs> with digital publishing, um, but uh, you know, it, it sort of goes back to my my computer science background. It it just seemed like a natural place to be, and it didn't have half the headaches that the print side had. Yeah, um, you know, having uh, as a a bookseller, I was in touch with a lot of small press publishers, so I I heard all the horror stories. Um, 
but then one of them convinced me to start a magazine. So, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's been going for a while. So, I mean, it's it's been going well then. Mm -hmm. Will we ten? Uh, it, it was founded at ReaderCon in July, almost ten years ago. So we'll be celebrating our tenth uh, uh, conception birthday, <laughs> then and and then the tenth anniversary in October. That's awesome. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, back on the collector front, front I, I myself, um, I'm a, I like I like my books as well, and my my office walls continue to just grow bookshelves, so I have places um, to put them. And actually, my dad was a toy collector, so mm -hmm. I'm I'm very versed in the in the world of collecting. <laughs> oh yeah, it it, it is a, a bit of an illness, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's fun. I mean, I recently just been discovering, you know, basically different book uh, covers. You know, you've got the ones, you know, in the UK, they're just completely different than what we have. And some of them are better. So I I've been, you know, trying to acquire some of those of some of my, fa you know, more favorite books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a while there, they were the they were the better editions. Um, of course, the, the, they weren't printed as nicely, but, uh, you know, the, the art was always better. I think they're they're kind of even now. You know, you'll get some variation by by title uh, every now and then. I'll find a UK edition that I like more than the US, but then I'll have both of them because you know <laughs> collector. Yeah, totally. Well, yeah, it does. Um, they are more even as of recently, as far as like you know quality in the art. But yeah, there's certain ones that's just like you know you kind of grab it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you are a Hugo Award winning editor. That's a pretty fancy title. <laughs> that's gotta. Uh, that's gotta feel good. I mean, I I can under I, I can appreciate you know, chugging away at things. So I mean, that must feel good. It's it's a very surreal thing. Um, you know, I have, you know, three rockets sitting on a shelf, and that's what my idols as a kid had. You know, now of course they got it in the tougher categories, <laughs> <laughs> but still, you know, to have that that sort of connection to to the history of the field, absolutely, it's, it's pretty cool. And uh, you know, it's uh, uh, you know, we we won in the semi prosing category, which we're no longer eligible in, but I've been nominated a few times, including this year for the ed editor short form category, which is like pushing pushing it up into bigger leagues yeah uh, oh, so, wow. you know, to be in that company uh, you know coming into the field the way I did is, is uh, it's mind-blowing at times I bet I bet so you and you were you've been um, teaching computer science correct um, no I work in in uh, education uh, high okay. ed and k-12 and occasionally my, my responsibilities have drifted to teaching. Um, uh, but most of the time, it's it's more on the academic technology side, where I'm I'm collaborating with faculty to uh, uh, to do either instructional design or help them uh, figure out how to bring a certain technology into their curriculum. Oh, I see. I I apologize. I misread that when I was uh, when I was reading up on your blog. <laughs> no, it's, um, it's a confusing field uh, for people who are, who aren't in it because the terminology is all crazy and. And it's changed a lot since I got into it. It was one of the reasons why I, I, I guess I'm, I've lost my passion for it uh, in the, the last few years is that the, the educational system has changed drastically and everybody's an expert now and it's very hard to get anything done in that environment. Yes, that sounds like a tricky environment to get things done in. Yep. Um, but so, and then... So as you've been doing all that, you've been launching Clark's World and Worm Publishing and, I mean, so many anthologies. I I, I knew that you had done a few and I, I look, you know, I clicked over. You've you've edited so many. <laughs> um, so you've been... Well, to, to be fair, a good chunk of that are the annual Clark's World anthologies. So it's sort of double dipping. <laughs> fair I enough. Mean, we're, we're taking all the stories we got from, from the year in the magazine and just and reissuing them as a book. And that largely came about because there's some people who just prefer books and we yeah. want the stories to be read. So we do what we have to. Well, and those, are, those themselves are pretty nice uh, collector's items. You, you know, you've got all the stories in one spot. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's nice. So you were just basically doing all that um, on top of, you know, working full time. Yes. And being a dad and yeah. a husband and, <laughs> and, and all the stuff that comes with that, too. That's so great. The I 
the work life balance, man, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. It's a tricky thing to, you know, and especially, you know, in, in, in the world of the words, so to speak, you know, you can, uh, you can, it's like time traveling all of its own, you know, <laughs> it really is. I mean, I'll sit down to like do one thing and I look up and I'm like, wow, that was just going to be an hour, but it was a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that I'm familiar with that. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so, uh, can you, uh, tell us a little bit about the anthology that you have coming up in, in June 7th? Oh, yeah. Um, it's the first volume uh, of the best science fiction of the year. Um, it's published by Nightshade Books. Uh, and uh, it's basically my entry into uh, an already populated year's best field. Um, and what I did last year was basically read every short story I could find um, on top of everything that I was receiving at Clark's World. And uh, I just kept a running list of the stories I really liked. And then uh, towards the end of the year, I started filtering them down and, and uh, picked uh, 250,000 words of wow. what I thought were the best. Wow. So it's not uh, just exclusive to Clark's World? Like oh, no, no. It's, it's a wide variety of different markets uh, from anthologies um, fr uh, to other magazines. Um, and then there's also a recommended reading list at the back, which includes some of the ones that, that I just didn't have room for. Um, and uh, uh, the introduction is sort of a, a summary of the field, um, particularly as it applies to the, the magazine and short fiction market. Um, so, yeah, that's something I hope to, to keep doing is going back and looking at how things have changed. And I sort of just set a baseline with this year's. That's really cool. So, and... Um, where, how did you come up with, with the idea to just kind of scope out all these different, um, stories to, well, like I said, there, you know, there's other people who've been doing it a long time. Like the, 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 the big one right now is Gardner Dozois, um, his year's mm -hmm. best is, is the sort of the king of the hill. So, um, so I've been reading that one. He's up to, you know, 30 something volumes at this point. Oh, wow. Um, and, and I remember reading them when I was reading um, um, a series by the same title. Terry Carr actually edited the best science fiction of the year back when I was much younger. Um, and I remember reading those. So I sort of uh, have a little intimidation factor going on having the same title as, <laughs> as, as his set. Um, but uh, it, so, so it's something that's been in the, in the history of the field for a long time. Um, and then, you know, as, as I was working on, uh, various projects, somebody noticed, um, uh, what I was doing and, and, uh, um, Nightshade approached me to see if I would be interested in working on this with them. So, um, nice. uh, so I'm much appreciative of, <laughs> of the confidence they've, they've had in me and, and, uh, uh, the faith in, in backing this project. Um, and one thing I've actually, and I've, I've discovered this just recently, um, that uh, Clark's World uh, magazine also has a podcast with the audio versions of of the stories. Yeah, we podcast every story we publish. Um, so it can be anywhere, uh, seven or eight stories a month. Um, and it's, uh, like I said before, we, we have to get this, we want to see the stories read by people. That's sort of the editor's job is to make it the best it can be and make it sure, make sure that the author's work is read. Um, so we found out at one point, um, oh God, uh, several, many years ago, that there was a large audience of people who, who prefer to consume their short fiction in audio form. So we went off in that direction. And at some point I made the very smart decision to, to bring Kate Baker on board <laughs> as our podcast director. And she just knocks it out of the park every every month. Yeah, she's great. I've been listening. It's it's really fun. It's uh I like to both read and listen to my fiction uh depending mm -hmm. on what I'm doing. So it's 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 very cool. Um and it is. I mean, reading out loud is, you know, as you're well aware is a, you know, pretty clutch way to edit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh you know, and and you know, bringing somebody in like Kate spares the rest of you from having to listen to me read them. So <laughs> 
I've, uh, I've, I've recently started a, a weekly serial, um, fictional podcast, and uh, I actually kind of found my way to that by just, you know, editing my own stuff and reading it out loud, because if I don't read it out loud, you know, it's not readable. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So that's kind of, it's it's fun, just, you know, how so much has, how technology has changed over the last 10 years has just, just changed the world of publishing and how people get content. It's pretty crazy. Oh, yeah. The last 10 years have been something of a wild ride in the field. I mean, when we started, um, it was just after um, Sci Fiction, the Sci-Fi Channel's uh, mag- online magazine that was edited by Ellen Datlow. It had recently closed. And uh, they were pretty much the only online magazine at the time that was getting any sort of respect or recognition. Um, you know, there was Strange Horizons was around at that point, but th- there was still a lot of um, stigma to be associated with an online magazine. In fact, in the first three years, we'd invite authors to uh, submit stories to us. And even though we were paying more than you know, Analog or Asimov's or FNSF, uh, I would get uh, a statement thrown back at me. I'm sorry, I don't publish online. Um, oh, wow. It, that, that's only for newbie writers <laughs> and, and and pirates. They were hung up on pirates at the time. Oh, yes. Uh, I remember. <laughs> they were all afraid their, their stories were going to be um, <laughs> put into slavery on some boat somewhere. And, um, but the, the, With the uh, pirate and the, the whole deal. <laughs> yeah, the whole, the whole scene, though, changed over you know those first three years. And you know, I don't... I think I I realized just realized one day, hey, wait, nobody's saying that to me anymore. Um, and hey, look, a number of us are getting in, into years bests or um, having our stories on awards ballots. And I think the industry changed. I think one of the things I've said to um, self published authors, for example, is they quite often feel that second class status. And uh, you know, definitely, I, I I've said said to a, a few of them that. You know, that's where we were 10 years ago. Um, so the field is changing and people will eventually come around and, you know, you were there early. So <laughs> so in, enjoy the ride and, and, you know, the respect will come with the quality. Um, they can't deny it for too long. It is quite a ride. So, I yeah. mean, the first, I guess, you know, while you were building all this, basically, I mean, can you, where you are now with it and you look back at like, you know, that first year or two or however, like, what was that like? We never expected to be around this long. I mean, everyone kept telling us, oh, you'll be dead in a year. Um, And not physically, but (laughs) the magazine would be dead in a year. Um, And and there's, you know, there's something, uh, I guess, about my mindset that people keep, if you keep telling me that, I'm going to get more and more stubborn. And I think that's really something that somebody who's publishing online needs to be yeah uh to i mean you, you need skill and you also need to be stubborn because a lot of people are going to tell you you can't do it um and like i said i i came into this field totally outside of things i i didn't have uh any experience working for a publisher previously i i had one english course in college um so it, it's a very that's intense um, yeah i mean there's a lot of opportunity uh, if you're willing to try something different and not listen to the people who say it won't work. I mean, <laughs> yep. at, at this point, there's a lot of things have been tried and, and it, you can get some pretty good advice from people who've been there. But, you know, back then it was Wild West and, you know, we we had we had grand ideas uh, and never expected to still be here. Yeah. And now it's and now how I knew this before, you know, now I'm blanking on the dates, but how many years has it? has it been going now Have so it, it will be 10 yeah uh, that's right that's right we're coming up yeah. on 10 yeah which, which is an, alone i mean we hit our 100th that's issue a decade. last year and that was a, a a a really odd experience but this is going to be even more i mean to hit double digits um it's i don't know especially this year this year's a lot of big numbers i i'm i'm turning 50 this year um, the magazine's turning 10 and I'm, you know, quitting my day job and trying to make a run at it. So, you know, there's wow. a, lot of, a lot of stuff going on here and then I've got the year's best coming out. So it's, it seems like the time to be trying these things. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, 
I, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I think 2016 is going to be a lot of fun. Well, that's awesome. I I just I I love I love this conversation so much. It's so it's so great to hear. I mean, because it's such you know when you're when you're knocking away at something, it can really just you know it can be a grind. So oh, yeah, well, ten years. <laughs> yeah, it's been a grind. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's. But you know, like you said, stubborn. I mean, I was actually just writing you know one of my rambling blog posts about this earlier today. How like being stubborn it assists me and it's you know it also fights to destroy me <laughs> yes but at the same time i think stubbornness needs to be combined with the true love of what you're doing absolutely I, I have not um there, there's not a single day that i've i've regretted the decision um uh, just to do this That's awesome. um and it's it's introduced me to some of the best people i've met um and it's it's just provided me with with lots of entertainment too well yeah don't, definitely i mean uh you have uh you get to read i mean all sorts of scale but some of the stories um are just uh they're awesome it's it's fun i bet and overwhelming well, you're, you're seeing the top of a 1200 story a month pile i was just gonna get there <laughs> that's intense it must be overwhelming um, you get into a routine and, and it, it gets easier, but um, every now and then that pile spikes upwards, so we have to to adjust. And then you have a is it? It's not just you that's going through them. It's a it's a team. There, there's a few of us. Um, I've uh, been reading a, a very significant portion of that pile. Um, last year, I think I read seventy percent as first read. Oh, plus wow. any of the things that the others liked. Um, so it, it it's a lot of stuff. Fortunately, I mean, with a lot of stories, you know, this isn't going to work for me. Yeah. Like, I have a major problem with zombie stories. <laughs> I, it's just, I, yeah. I can't, I, no matter how many times I tell people not to send them to me, it it, it doesn't work. There, there's more <laughs> zombie stories out there than any other. Um, so if I get a story and the first sentence is brains, I can generally tell it's not something I want. <laughs> Um, and you know, it's not just that category of things. There's, there's a lot of different, um, uh, and we have on our, our submission guidelines, a, a list of, of, of things that are hard sells and we're serious about those things. And every now and then we get some joker who tries to, uh, uh, use them all in a single story. Uh, <laughs> one of those jokers lives in this house. Um, so yes. One of my own children decided to, uh, to I love do it. that. But uh, yes, yeah, so, so you know, there, there's a lot. There's a lot. And you know, that said, there you know, there's some of the really easy ones to to reject. But then there's the really hard ones, and the really hard ones probably represent about two percent of that uh, that number. Um, and they're stories that I know will probably land somewhere else, um, but just weren't right, or it was the wrong time. We just bought a story just like that, or two stories just like that. We can't take a third, right? Um, yeah, you know, so it's and you know recently I I had to pass on a story that you know I just I I didn't I wasn't comfortable with the subject material. It was really good, but um it wasn't um it wasn't something I felt comfortable being the editor on. It's got to be um a, like a gut thing where you you really have to like as you're reading it, you know, you have like a signal somewhere that says, you know, this isn't for me or you know, there's probably some of that that you know makes it hard to make some decisions, but you've got to, you got to go with it. Oh yeah. No, there, there's, yeah. And, and you can't worry about making a mistake, uh, like passing on a story that, that does well. I mean, we've, we've rejected some doozies, um, uh, that went on for, to get some great critical acclaim. It just wasn't right for us. And, you know, I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, when I first started, it was always, there was this bit of fear that I was going to miss something or, uh, uh, or uh, or make some other kind of mistake, and and you know, ten years later, I'm like, okay, this is this is fine now. We, You're hardened. We, we, no. <laughs> these things happen, and I you, know, you talk to other editors, and they all feel the same. You know, they they we all have the story of the one that got away. You know, we're like a bunch of fishermen. You know? <laughs> now, based on like you know what's popular in um, uh, fantasy and science fiction. Do you notice like an influx of that particular um, 
type of story or, you know, when you said zombies, it made me think of that. Like, whatever is, like, the the buzz at the moment, you know, do you find yourself, like, you know, rushed with vampires when there's vampires everywhere or that kind of thing? Yeah, there, there's a few things that trigger a, a, a flood on a particular theme. You know, the, the worst case is somebody just announced an open call for a theme anthology. Um, like, uh, uh, like somebody's say somebody's doing a, an anthology that's focused on wizards. Okay. I know you know, over the next six months, I'm going to get every story they rejected. Um, <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> so, yeah, and you can see it in, in the slush pile. You have this like you know, 10,000 foot view of what's going on in the field and you can see different themes or different subject material coming up and, and going in and out of fashion. Um, and periodically I try to track it and see what, see what I can find out about it. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a numbers junkie. So I play with the data uh, on what, what comes in and what, uh, what we're buying and, and, and where we're buying it from, you know, what parts of the world are kind of active. You know, the, you know, that's odd really interesting. Statistics that catch my eye sometimes, like the podcast. For some reason, one of the top ten countries listening to our podcast is Iran. Interesting. Yeah, um, totally surprised me. Um, and then you know we we hear now from a few people, um, you know, and and we try to reach out to these different communities that we're working in because you know Clark's World has um, we're trying to to do an emphasis on on being a little more international. Um, I mean, we do a translation in every issue. We, um, we try to encourage, uh, um, people from all over the world to, to submit or read, uh, the magazine. Cause we have to think uh, these days, I think the only way uh, a magazine is going to succeed is by thinking globally. Yeah. Um, because there are, there are so many, um, audiences that, that read English that are outside the, the typical, you know, United States, Canada, Australia, UK, um, so, you know, it's it's a bit of a challenge to do that, but uh, I think it's it's a, a worthy investment in time. No, definitely. Well, I, you know, and I never, perspective's so funny. I never thought of, you know, you have your ear to the pulse of the industry in just a whole different way. Mm-hmm. It, it's pretty cool. It's one of the reasons I tell people that um, they should, you know, if they're, if they're interested in, in, in improving their writing, volunteer to be a slush reader for somewhere um, and, and do it. And then when you stop getting anything out of it, quit. Cause no one should do that all the time. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, it gives you some very interesting perspective on common mistakes. You I I have routinely have them uh, slush readers telling me I've realized that um, I make that mistake. I keep seeing it. But I never realized it was a mistake until I saw it repeated several hundred times, uh, and and then just realizing, oh, maybe I shouldn't write a unicorn story right now, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and that's good advice most of the time. Yeah. But the, <laughs> but yeah. So you know, there's day. I'm I'm not a writer, but there are days where after reading the slush, I almost feel like I could. I bet. No, that's really interesting. Uh, reading the slush pile. I've I've never thought about that. I mean, I, you know, as you've probably put together, I am a writer and I've been trying to continue to improve myself um, and my, you know, and my craft and doing different things. But I got to say, now you totally have me wanting to read some slush. (laughs) I'm I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) No, don't be sorry. I'm curious. You piqued my curiosity. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, it's definitely something I think is is a, a good experience for for a lot of writers, and you know at least in our process, um, you know I make you know if if you're reading slush for me, one of the things I make you do is is uh, tell me why. You know, I'm not going to just let you say no, this is no good. You've got to tell me why, and if I don't if I don't buy your excuse, I'm going to go in and read the story myself, and 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 because uh, uh, you know they don't get to just pass anything out. Um, uh, but most of the time, they they learn what I'm what I'm looking for, and what what um, which I can't even define myself. I've <laughs> I've, I've tried multiple times. I, I think that what I tend to be looking for is what I haven't seen already. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and that's a really uh, horrible way of of telling people what you want. Uh, 
so one of the things I'll do then is they'll, they'll give me their comments, but when they pass something up, they also have comments on it. And when I see one of these stories, they'll get some notes back um, if I don't take the story uh, so that they can get a better understanding of why the story they liked enough to send over to me wasn't um, passed or didn't get past me. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so then it, it gives them some more um, uh, experience there. And, and over tools time, to look for as those, well. Those comments might get shorter and shorter as, as you get better at picking stories for me. But, um, you know, so sometimes it might just be ending. Because, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. you know, you know, I, you know, if the story fails, the, the worst sin for me is failing the ending. If you have a really good story oh. and you get all the way to the end and you just blow it, um, uh I, I find that more un, unforgivable than a, an absolutely terrible story um, yeah. because there was, there was some promise here and you had me incited and then you, you, you pulled the rug out from under me. Yes. Well, as, yeah, as a, as both a reader and a writer there, I have to agree with you. I mean, well, I'll be reading a book and I'm just like, I'm in it and I've, I, it's got all of me. And then I get to the end and I'm just like, what? Come on. <laughs> and then, <laughs> You know, right now I'm finishing a content editing um, back from my editor on a young adult novel. And the ending right now is like, it's keeping me up at night. I'm like, is that, there's just like, there's something there that's just like poking at me. So I feel you're there with the ending. There's mm -hmm. a, a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, but uh, so you have the best science fiction of the year anthology releasing in June 7th. And then um, Clark's World Magazine comes out every month, correct? Yes, on the tomorrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what I was doing before before we we started. I was trying to finish uh, uh, wrap up the June issue. Oh nice. Yeah. Yeah, the, on the 31st, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we run very close to the wire on on Clark's World and Forever and and, and any of the monthly projects I'm doing. All right. I'm try I'm trying to get better at that. Uh, it's one of the things I hope to to do when 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 I quit the 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 day job is to have more time to focus on getting the schedule. Um, so I'm not uh, constantly stressing myself out. My, my doctor does not appreciate it. Yeah, no. Well, the, the, the stuff that keeps returning, I mean, I've, uh, this is episode, this is episode uh, 12 of too many words. And then in June, um, the show's transitioning to twice weekly. Um, but uh, yeah, so just, I've been like right up against it too. And I've been trying to look at myself and figure out how I can, you know, not, you know, make myself eat my hair. <laughs> yeah. The the problem I have is that I know exactly how long it takes me to do these things. Yeah. So, so, so I can, I feel comfortable getting all the way to the, to the wire. Cause I know I can make it and that's not a good, healthy <laughs> way of looking at things. Yeah. No, I have the same trouble with my, with that too. Like I, I know that if I, you know, I push something really hard, you know, I can wrap up this one thing and, you know, a half a day. And so I, I leave it to the end and yeah, it's, uh, it's bad for stress levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I've been, uh, I'm, I'm from New Jersey and anytime that I, especially now, cause I've been out of New Jersey for 10 years and I haven't been there to visit for almost five. So anytime that I see, you know, I cross paths with um, somebody from New Jersey, my uh, previous book manager um, was from Jersey. There's always just like, I always just want to like an extra reach, be like, hey, <laughs> even though it's like, you know, it's a totally like people who aren't from New Jersey or haven't lived there for a certain amount of time, you know, have no idea actually how big and different different parts of it is. Well, we intentionally put the highways through like dumps and factories <laughs> and things like that because we don't want anyone else moving here. I mean, it's a little crowded already, but you know, I, I live up next to a wildlife refuge, so you know, it's uh, uh, it's not the the picture of New Jersey that most people think. Well, it, it's true, and um, my husband, who's from um, uh, South Jersey, you know, he had just wide open fields, and you know, it, there are parts that are really beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I grew up between two shopping malls. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you? Um, so I lived in Westwood. So, okay. Yeah. So I was like uh, basically like right on the border of Paramus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you said two malls, I sort of figured that was one of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're we're uh, 
we're a little more removed from the malls and stuff like that. I, I, I've pretty much lived my entire life within 20 miles of where I am now. Oh, wow. Um, uh, despite the fact, yeah, I'd love to, to move somewhere that didn't get as cold in the winter. Um, I, I'm just done with snow. Um, but my family is, is quite content to, to stay here and, um, I'm not going to disrupt them for, for my inability to deal with the snow. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I gotta say that's like my one complaint about living in Seattle is that we don't get snow. Well, now you're selling me on moving to Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I've been there a couple of times and I really liked it. So. Oh, I love it. I mean, I don't know. Like I. My whole life growing up, I just had this, like, you know, I would hear Seattle and I'd be like, you know, I, that just feels like a Jamie friendly place. And then I just, you know, my husband and I moved, moved here without any plans, lived on a boat for a couple of months and, you know, we've made it work. I love it out here. That must be a story in itself, living on a boat for, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, it's like landing on another coast and moving into a boat. Yeah, <laughs> it's like... well, it, it was, so we totally, like, we had no plan. Like, we were in in the middle of jobs and living situations, and he was looking um, for a job, you know, basically in the North Jersey area outside of New York, and he was like, well, how about here? You know, how about here? And I was like, I don't want to live there, and I don't want to live there. And he's like, where do you want to live? And I was like, Seattle. And two weeks later, we were driving his pickup truck, you know, or he was driving it. And I was, you know, a passenger um, across country. And, uh, yeah. And we landed in an extended stay hotel. And uh, we were just, like, looking at different places to live. And on Craigslist, we passed a houseboat listing. And he's like, oh, I always wanted to live on a houseboat. I was like, all right. So, yeah, <laughs> there we were. It was pretty cool, especially now that, you know, we're doing the kid thing. It's it's cool mm -hmm. that we lived on a boat because I couldn't live on a boat with kids. I'd go crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the uh, th that sounds like it would be a lot of fun. I mean, j just the ability to get up and go. And, yeah, once you have kids, you're sort of anchored for a little while. And I my youngest is, is 13 now. Okay. Uh, and the, the oldest is, is 16. So it's a lot different at this point. I bet. I'm in, uh, we're, we're in the elementary school years now. We've, my youngest is just about to wrap up kindergarten and then my oldest is about to wrap up second grade. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot of fun at, at those ages. They, they have such a sense of, uh, uh, adventure. And, uh, uh yeah. when I used to, you know, I, when I was working in K-12, I used to like working with the, the younger grades because they're fearless. You know, they, they'll, they'll try things and, and put their teachers to shame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, they are. They are really fun ages. Um, handfuls of an age. It's an intense oh, yeah. combination. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's funny, too, because they're such in that little kid spot that, like, I hear, like, I hear myself, like, basically just, like, you know, like, stop making noise. Stop having fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's past 7 o'clock. Go to bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're fine, and I'm the one turning into a pumpkin, but... Uh-huh. That's yeah, they have infinite energy. There's no, oh my, don't even try. No. Well, Neil, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was, it was a lot of fun having you on. No, thank you. This, this was fun. Um, can you uh, tell everybody where to, where to find you? Okay. Um, <laughs> I have uh, my blog or my, my website is uh, Neil, uh, neilclark.com and it's N-E-I-L dash C-L-A-R-K-E dot com. Someone either misspells the first or last name always. Um, uh, it might be easier to find Clark's World Magazine, even if you spell it wrong. Uh, it still comes up in Google, so that's clarksworldmagazine.com. Um, I also have Forever Magazine, uh, which is forever-magazine, and Worm Publisher, Worm Publishing, which is wormpublishing.com, and it's worm, W-Y-R-M. Uh, yeah, so I have way too many websites. Um, uh, curse of being tech enabled yeah um and then are you on twitter at all people want oh, yeah, to shout yeah. out Clark's to you world on twitter okay. and uh, uh uh we have uh on neil dot clark on facebook and and uh we also have a clark's world uh facebook page so I, i'm not hard to find very googleable <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> well awesome neil thanks again oh well, th thank you for having me and uh 
have a, a good night. That was totally good stuff, right? Yeah, I had a lot of fun talking to Neil. Um, be sure to check out um, his Best Science Fiction of the Year anthology, June 7th. Um, it will be fully released on that date. Go check it out. Check out Clark's World Magazine, you know, and uh, be sure to shout out to Neil. Give him some love. It was uh, good stuff. And, I, you know, I think uh, I think that pretty much wraps it up for this show. That wraps it up. Um, next week is a big week. Too Many Words goes to Twice Weekly, so you can listen on Monday and you can listen on Thursday. Uh, I'm excited for this. Um, growing, driving, doing well. Uh, reach out to me on Twitter at me Bettingfield. Reach out to the show. Follow the show at uh, Too Many Words. Too Many Words Pod. And don't forget Chapter Nine of Elliot Granger and the Clueless Brigade. Um, the uh, written the written copy will be posted on uh, on Friday, and on Saturday you can listen to it on iTunes and Stitcher. Thanks again, guys, and talk to you next week.